Everyone, welcome to today's webcast. I'm your host, Microsoft MVP, Nick Cavalancia. Today's webcast is beyond the call quality dashboard, and we're trying to look at turning Microsoft Teams call information into Insight with Vantage DX. Um, it's a very interesting topic. I'm glad you're here today. I'm going to guess by the fact that you're attending that your organization doesn't just use Teams but relies on it and you've found a need to go beyond just the team's calls to actually well delve kind of into actually integrating with your own phone systems. And at the same time, because of that reliance, you have this need to actually ensure service quality. And so that's really what we're trying to drive at is how do we get service quality and how do we achieve maintaining that both sort of reactively and proactively. We're gonna look at both today a little bit. And so um, what I wanna do first off though, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. Today's webcast is being recorded. So if you, if you have to get off early, maybe you wanna share it with a colleague, we'll be sending out a link a little later on. Also, if you have any questions, I do have the uh, Q&A box here open in front of me. So if you have questions throughout the webcast today, please stick those in the Q&A box. Be happy to try and interject those as is appropriate throughout today's webcast, as well as uh, having a formal Q&A time at the end. Um, the format today is a little different rather than being death by PowerPoint, which I'm sure you're used to, and we've all seen way of many of those, um, this is more of a discussion. Tale. So if, I, if you take a look at the speakers that we have today, I have a, a really a, just a fantastic set of speakers with me today. Uh, we have first off Evan Saleschuk. He's a, a cloud solution architect from Microsoft. Evan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Nick and Martello. Glad to be here. Yep. Uh, we're also joined by Rob Juchette. Rob is the VP of Product Management over at Martello. Rob, we've done a bunch of these together. Um, I'm glad you're back. We're going to have a little fun today, I think. Don't you think? Uh, I think so. They always are. Glad to be here again, Nick. Yep. And one of our speakers, uh, Stefan Pinstrup, was supposed to be here today, had a family emergency. Um, not sure if he's going to suddenly join in sometime in the middle. We don't think he is. Um, but uh, but we were unfortunately weren't able to have him there. He was going to try to provide a little bit of a, a customer centric viewpoint of the discussion today. We're going to try and see if we can weave some of that in ourselves and perhaps he might pop in later on. We'll We'll find out if that happens here. If we take a look at the agenda, for today. Again, this is sort of a panel discussion. We're going to kind of go through this together, the three of us, and uh, and take a look at this, this, this issue of ensuring call quality. And what we want to do first off is talk about why you should be monitoring Teams calls for the service quality, not just Teams overall, but Teams call quality. We want to talk a little bit about the call quality dashboard and the CQD and what, what value it brings and the fact that there is some really good information that's in there that you can gain some insight out of. And we want to talk about how you augmenting that with other kinds of data. And we'll talk about what kinds of data that is, as well as how augmenting with that, that said data is actually going to improve your ability to ensure service delivery and that sort of thing. And then we'll just talk about some next steps as well. And of course, we'll have some formal Q&A time at the end. And as I mentioned, if you do have a question, I've got the Q&A box up here. If it seems contextual of what we're talking about at the moment, I will try to weave that in. So please feel free to, to pipe a question in. We've got a great panel of experts here today. So this is the time to definitely ask. So um, let's jump into our, our first topic here, which is the issue of why you need to be monitoring Teams call and service quality. Now, it's one thing that you can just assume that Teams works. Um, Microsoft has put a lot of effort into building a very robust, highly available, highly durable kind of, of platform for you to have these calls. But even Microsoft isn't you know, impervious to having some issues. And as we'll kind of dive in today, you're going to find that in, in a lot of cases, if you are having service quality issues with calls, it probably doesn't have a lot to do with Microsoft. So um, I'm going to actually sort of start with you, Rob. And you know maybe some of our audience isn't even monitoring Teams calls yet. And just when you're interacting with customers that maybe are, I should say, prospects that aren't yet even doing that, why are, why are you finding that it's really important to them? And maybe even from your own perspective, why is it important that they should be monitoring for service quality? Yeah, no, so we, we, we've heard from a lot of organizations that have moved to Teams over the last year or two and have done so in a, let's say, accelerated fashion. Uh, you know, under some duress as they did it. Uh, and now they're trying to get their arms around, well, we know everybody in the organization is using Teams and uh, that can enable a lot of uh, collaboration scenarios for our organization. But we also know that there's some challenges some some performance issues happening with uh, people's experience with Teams, uh, but they don't know why, right? And so there's a few data sources that we can stitch together to understand, starting with call quality data, which, uh, you know, thankfully, Microsoft is collecting a lot of this data 
from the team's client and providing that to an organization. So we get a great view already in terms of what I would call real user monitoring. How are real actual people interacting with teams? Are they getting a good experience or not? It's not going to necessarily tell us end to end why they might be having a bad experience, but at least I know where to start, right? Who, who is having a bad experience or which locations of my organization are having bad experiences? From there, we can drill in and we need to get some diagnostics. Okay, we know Nick is having bad calls all the time. Well, why, right? Microsoft is saying everything is up, everything looks fine. So, but there's a lot of other factors in that end to end puzzle, right? There's Nick's local network, his endpoint, his headset or his device he's using, his internet connectivity. Is it going through a VPN or are there proxies in play? There's lots of different moving pieces. And so having some diagnostics to look at that end to end flow can really help pinpoint where the problem is. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, another technology called synthetic transactions are really critical for this that test that application from end to end and make sure that you know 24 by 7 I know that Teams is working, OneDrive is working, SharePoint is working and I don't just mean that from the Microsoft tenant perspective but from a client right through to the Microsoft data center and back we're measuring those transactions and making sure everything is fine so that we get a proactive view of the environment. Now, I, I, I like when you talked about, you know, the, the VPN got me thinking down the path of Microsoft has their in, entire recommendation of, for example, for those of you in the audience, what your network architecture should look like. You know, things like having no hairpin turns, uh, eliminating any kind of services that would be monitoring the network traffic that might actually create um, some latency, that sort of thing. You know, there's very specific ways that a client should be going directly from wherever they connect to the internet right to the Microsoft Cloud. And even that connects. So I really like you bring that up, Rob, because that, that presents an interesting quandary here of a lot of other factors that come into play. But but switching back to, to, to gears, so you talked about, you know, Microsoft and Microsoft providing um, you know, that their services are up and things like that. I want to kind of talk about that for a second. And Evan, I'm going to kind of touch on you for a second here is, would you talk maybe about some of the ways that Microsoft has gone to these great lengths to ensure that there's really good call quality within Teams? Sure, yeah, thanks, Nick. And I really break it down into two different categories. And it's been something that Microsoft's been improving over years. And the two categories really are what the end user sees and what the end user doesn't see. So for example, what the end user doesn't see has to do with that network connectivity that, that Rob mentioned earlier. We wanna make sure that wherever an individual sits, whether it's at their home office, whether it's at their business, whether it's in a hotel room because they're traveling, they're as close to the Microsoft network as possible. Microsoft has the second largest network in the world. And what we wanna do is make sure wherever you happen to be in the world, you're connected to that network as quickly as you can. And we're doing that through peering relationships, through telecoms, ISPs, so that we reduce the amount of hops that it takes for you to get to the Microsoft network. But there's also what we're doing from end user perspective and some of the other things they don't necessarily see or the improvement in the codex. You might've been familiar with Satin, now we have Silk Codex and Silk and Satin Codex. The, are dynamic so when the bandwidth is poor you still have the ability to work even at seven kilobits per second beyond that it's even from my perspective what i can see as an end user maybe i'm talking on mute a message pops up and says hey you're talking on mute because we've all been on those calls where we have to tell somebody oh you're on mute so there's been a lot of improvements from that network connectivity to the client itself that you don't necessarily see, like even the improvements in how many resources it consumes. And then of course, what the end user does see, and that's continuing. And we're continuing to inject artificial intelligence and other capabilities into Microsoft Teams to make the experience better for you. And then lastly, there's of course the administrators and what we're doing with calling analytics. Calling Analytics is a reactive tool, but it's very powerful in being able to understand both perceived call quality and then technical call quality. As Rob mentioned, Microsoft's data may say, well, the call was good, but why was everybody complaining about how Evan sounded on the call? Well, maybe Evan wasn't using a qualified headset to talk to everybody, and that qualified headset gives you the ability to have wideband codecs. Without a qualified headset, that might not be the case. So those improvements have continued over years and will continue to make everybody's experience better, including your administrators, which is what we're talking about here today with calling analytics and really call quality dashboard.
Evan, we got a question from the audience that came in. Colleen's asking, um, it seems that Microsoft's monitoring is after the call, so to speak. Um, but what right. about during the call? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and you know, calling analytics is that tool that you use after the call because the data is then collected and presented to the administrators. When we get into call quality dashboard, though, I'll argue that it can be both a reactive and proactive tool. If it's set up properly and if you know how to look at the data, it gives you trends and you can analyze those trends over time. And the idea really is looking at that data to understand there's a potential issue occurring or will occur. And it gives you the administrator or administrators the ability to address that issue before it impacts your end users. And it becomes a key tool in what Microsoft uses, what our partners use, but of course, you need to know how to set it up properly. You need to know how to look at that data, which if you don't have uh, a lot of experience with it or a lot of time, it can be a little more challenging. Yeah, it's interesting, C Colleen, uh, there's there's a need for like real user monitoring that Rob talked about before, which would be something in real time, kind of, and, and there's some of that built into Teams, but you know, trying to identify that someone's having a problem sometimes becomes, a, 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 you, again, with the myriad of different sources of potentially where the problem is caused from, is one of the one of the issues that come into play here. Certainly, Microsoft can just figure out whether or not a call has any latency or there's a delay or you know, those kinds of things. But when it's something like um, you happen to be VPNing from France over to New York, and then you're connected to an office in New York that then actually traverses back over to, I don't know, Poland or something, and then goes from Poland to the Microsoft Cloud. I mean, that kind of thing could actually happen in a in a you know a global conglomerate kind of organization. Right, and, and I think so one, of you gonna... had, one of you had mentioned that you know, VPN earlier and that Microsoft recommends don't use VPN. And, and yeah. Nick, you just described what happens when you use a VPN. And, that's why we want to get you as close to the Microsoft network as quickly as possible. And well, using a VPN when you're traveling may not accomplish that. No, that makes perfect sense to me as well. So let's do this. Um, let's jump ahead to uh, back to the, the title slide here for a second and uh, of our, our topic here. And Rob, I want to throw more question back at you. You kind of delved into this a little bit, but I'd love for you to go into a bit more detail because there's all this stuff that we've kind of talked about that's outside of the control of Microsoft. So go one more slide ahead, Rob. Uh, and and you know, there's all these things that we're kind of even just talking about right now, maybe the network, the VPN. You know, what are what are some of the other aspects of the connection? Like, you know, we've, you've talked about end to end. Maybe let's define that for a moment. You know, what are the things between the user on their whatever their personal or corporate device and the Microsoft Cloud that you that you're coming in contact with that customers have to be worried about? Yeah, no, it's uh, there, there's a wide range of, of variables there, and we've touched on some of them already, like the endpoint performance, right? If the, the endpoint is overwhelmed by some other application or something running there, it's going to affect the team's, the team's application's ability to deliver a great service. Evan touched a little bit about the certified or qualified headsets and why they're important to use with, with respect to uh, with uh, the, the selection of codecs. Uh, we get local network performance, right? We, we've seen a lot of cases where people are at home, they're competing with bandwidth or co connectivity in their own local network, or they're sitting a little bit too far from their access point. Se seems like very simple issues, but they do happen very regularly. Uh, and then there's a myriad of, of networking uh, possibilities that happen from there. VPN is one we hear all the time, uh, especially you know people returning back to the office, right? People have been at home uh, and maybe having a great experience at home, and you would think when they go back to their nice, well-tuned corporate network, everything is going to be even better. Uh, and, it, and it's often not, right? And there's a couple reasons to that. But, you know, Nick, Nick and I, we've talked about this in previous webinars. Uh -huh. right? A lot of these offices were architected for voice, not for video and collaboration. So there's one aspect. Uh, and then maybe there are persistent VPNs in, in these offices, back to head, head offices, you know, uh, headquarters, that sort of thing. And we've seen, you know, users have a great experience at home. They go back to the office, and now they're having a terrible experience, uh, not because you know anything has changed per se in terms of their endpoint, their use of Teams, or or what Microsoft is delivering. But now, you know, you mentioned that example: somebody in Europe is now being taken to some data center in in the U.S. because it's following the path of the VPN. Um, so, and there's, you know, we have security proxies and cloud proxies and and things like that uh, across the internet into the Microsoft data centers. 
Uh, and then we haven't even really talked about the PSTN world where now we've got session border controllers and SIP trunk providers and a whole nother chunk of uh, networking stuff, let's say, that must work well for the end-to-end -end experience to, to be great. Yeah, completely agree there. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Patrick actually mentioned something here that uh, we all know the answer to, but he said that we mentioned that Microsoft not re recommending VPNs when uh, users are trying to connect to Teams. He says that includes split tunneling. And of course, the answer there is if if the split tunnel is defined that when someone is supposed to go to the Microsoft Cloud, they go directly to the Microsoft Cloud, that's absolutely fine. It's just about utilizing a VPN in order to get access to the Microsoft Cloud that ends up adding an extra layer. And I'm about to sneeze, so excuse me a second even managed to get myself on mute. All right, so um, let, let's do this. Let's um, jump ahead to the next slide here and talk about the value of the call quality dashboard because there is value inherently in there. Um, yeah, and maybe Evan, what I'd like to do is, you know, do thinking about, you, you started by talking about the data in the call quality dashboard, the call analytics, um, and maybe this is sort of, I'm gonna, even though I've got CQD kind of as the topic here, maybe you kind of mash the two together conceptually for our topic here, but would you talk a little bit about the visibility that Microsoft's providing with uh, call quality dashboard, with uh, call analytics, maybe even use of PowerShell, can you talk a little bit about those things? Sure, yeah, and, and, the way that I look at this when I'm doing troubleshooting is I we have a scenario and let's say we're all on a call together and again somebody complained about audio quality video quality but only maybe one person was experiencing that as an admin I'm going to go to calling analytics and take a look so that I have some data now that data is broken down into a lot of different categories and you can go pretty deep you can even look at the debug logs from the client perspective but that information gets pretty complex. So if it's really visible, Microsoft will make you aware of that through calling analytics. If it's not, you're gonna to have to do some poking around and have some experience using that tool to be able to find out where that problem may have occurred and how to prevent it in the future. I used the example before, not using a qualified headset. It's not that hard to see when somebody's not using a qualified headset. So the solution is, let's send them a qualified headset or a qualified endpoint. Now, when we get into a call quality dashboard, again, I mentioned earlier, it's important to set it up properly. What you need to be able to do is populate different building data for the organization. So that allows for, we understand when somebody is on the corporate network, so they're working from your building, or they're outside the corporate network working at home or you know traveling in, in a hotel room at, or a, at a customer site. And just that delineation becomes really important because we talked about earlier that I feel that call quality dashboard can be used as a, a reactive and proactive tool. So we'll see trends over time, but there's a lot of data that's presented there. So Microsoft is giving you that visibility into the data. You can see it using call quality dashboard and we continue to improve upon that using things like the Power BI reports, the quality of experience reports that again you need to set up and have a look at. We're making it somewhat easier uh, for administrators to be able to look at those trends and analyze that over time. And the way that I look at it is we're bringing it down a level. No insult to level one or level two support people but what we want to be able to do is you don't need a level three support person to necessarily do all the troubleshooting. Level two can take a look at it or level one. And the idea there is time to resolution. When there's a problem and your CEO is involved, we wanna make sure that problem is, is mitigated or eliminated as quickly as possible. Or ideally, again, using trends and analysis, prevent that problem for that CEO ever occurring because you'll be able to see that data. So really it's a combination of a lot of things, but it's something that you have to keep an eye on. It's not something that is going to alert you necessarily when there is a problem, although you can start setting some of that information up. But we're not giving you all the data. And as Rob mentioned, they're starting to look at all the other aspects of what could affect call quality. He mentioned session border controller involvement and other aspects of how the network might be set up. That's all really important as well. Yeah, one of our audience members, Petri, actually mentions here uh, that the CQD, of course, is, is providing average values. So someone could have, he could, the, Petri gives the example of, you could have a two-hour meeting and the user's suffering issues during the first 15 minutes. But when you look at the average overall, 
it looked like it was an okay call, so to speak. And, and that becomes where you're going to dig a little deeper. And the other part that's interesting about this that you're mentioning, Evan, is just this idea of trying to be, you know, maybe proactive and looking at maybe trends. And there is a lot of data. And the goal for all of you here, if you think about this, if we step away from the technologies for a second, is we have all this information about calls, about uh, maybe connectivity, about use of applications, all this different information. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to turn that into an intelligence so we can figure out things like trends, things like someone is having a problem, it's outside of a particular um, uh, uh, level of acceptable use, that kind of thing. Maybe it's too slow or there's too many uh, breaks in the, the calls, that sort of thing. But then you're trying to turn the intelligence really into insights so it becomes where you, what actions can you take. So we're trying to go from information to intelligence to insight. And if we can accomplish that, and the call quality dashboard really does certainly take us from information to intelligence. Um, and then in some ways, depending on if you're seeing, for example, that someone's having, you know, like you, they have to give the example of just the headset, where you can see that everybody in the office seems to be having no problem except for Rob, and Rob's got cheap co. I hope there's not a cheap co because it just bashed them. A cheap co headset, you know, and and then well then you have now that's turned into insight because now you figure that out and you have an action. So there is value there. Um, Rob, I'm sitting there thinking about you know Microsoft has always historically um, purposely left these sort of gaps in the product lines and the platforms they've built so that partners can augment those platforms. And I think that remains true even in the case of the call quality dashboard. Um, so what are some of the use cases, without getting too pitchy, but just did from a sort of a technical standpoint, what are some of the use cases where Martello's providing you know, some of that augmentation through the use of the CQD data and then going beyond? Yeah, so I think what's, uh, what's easiest here is I'll actually show a couple of use cases in action. Uh, where within Martello's Vantage DX solution, we're consuming the call quality data that Microsoft gathers from Teams endpoints and stores it in the tenant. We can pull it all in and start to do some inter interesting things with it. So I've just got a few, we'll walk through a very, a uh, couple simple examples. Uh, one is, you know, we're looking at what we call, we've defined what we call a dynamic office. And these offices are basically uh, looking at all the Teams call quality data, uh, associating that call back to a common public IP address and making some assumptions that, hey, it looks like you have some offices in these locations because you have you know, more than one user making calls. So I can get some idea here in terms of what's happening in, uh, around the world for my organization and drilling in, I'll be able to see uh, you know, what, what this location is, who are my top users in that location, uh, some performance characteristics and uh, statistics about that location, uh, who's making calls, what sort of poor calls are happening, quite, quite a bit of information here. Uh, and so a few other scenarios, I'm gonna just jump around a little bit, is you know, I might wanna look at a particular location like Geneva. And now what I'm doing is I'm instantly seeing all the data that uh, applies to Geneva, users that are there, meetings that have happened, uh, ISPs that are delivering service to that location, a lot of different things that we can drill into really quickly. Um, we see here we have a user, David Cunningham, I could have searched for his name as well, if I have you know, a, a classic help desk scenario where David's calling and yelling at me for his poor experience this morning, uh, I can drill in here and start to understand, okay, well, what, what sort of data do we have about data, about David? Uh, we know where he is and the ISPs that are being used. And one of the views that we have here is associating the user to all the devices and networks that they are operating on. So I can see he's using a lot of different devices on different networks, which is fine and normal. And I see one that's highlighted here as problematic. And if I drill in here, uh, I can get some information about, well, what was the device he was using? What ISP was he using? What sort of connection type? All the types of things we've been talking about, headsets that were being used. Uh, what the history of his calls using that network and device combination have been. And so I'm already getting some information here uh, that I can go back with David and say, well, you know, I see that when you have your Windows device at home, everything is fine. But when you have that same device in your Swiss office, things seem to be going awry, right? Maybe it's a VPN scenario that we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, so we're already starting to provide some basic insights here in terms of uh, what this might mean from, from, the, from the data. We, we get an alert here for every poor experience that David has had recently, which captures, uh, again, a lot of the data that we talked about, what sort of connection was made at that time of the call, bandwidth available, uh, what signal was he using, signal strength, performance characteristics, 
you know, here we can see there's some information being returned in terms of what might be going on. Looks like it could be a Wi-Fi signal strength issue. Uh, lots of different things we can do here. Uh, one of the use cases that uh, a lot of our customers uh, like is the ability to forward these things directly into an ITSM system. So natively out of the box, we can send you an email when these things happen or run a PowerShell script. So you can leverage some things that you may be already doing with PowerShell. Uh, but then also from an ITSM perspective, you know, maybe my, my company is already set up to respond to tickets and service now. Well, I can just send, take this insight from Vantage DX and forward that along to ServiceNow so it can be triaged for in their normal process. And that, that integration is bi-directional. So if the help desk person you know, flags it as fixed, we'll go back and clean up the associated alerts. Or on the other hand, if the alerts go away and you know, the, the David, I guess we were talking about, all of a sudden starts having a great experience for days on end, we can also reach back into the service now environment and update the ticket that way as well. Um, so though I've showed some very simple searches. I want to touch on sort of one more complex version before we jump back to Slideware. And uh, we, we ship a number of uh, queries out of the box to get you started because it goes well beyond just my simple examples of typing in a name or a location. One of the ones that we've uh, talked a lot with customers that they uh, that they'd like to get their uh, their eyes on is uh, and, and here's sort of the syntax query. We won't go through all the query here, but you know I, I'm looking at all meetings that have taken place uh, where there have been uh, more than eight attendees. Uh, and where at least two or more have had a poor experience in that meeting. So these could represent, I mean, the numbers may vary by organization, but you can imagine when you're doing things like board meetings, virtual town halls, large uh, you know, business reviews, maybe with external uh, stakeholders, I can now sort of filter this down to, just show me the big meetings that are happening where a lot of people are having a poor experience. And then I can drill into details behind, behind that to find out what, what might be happening. Rob, there's one of our audience members, Ray, is asking, do, do we get active alerts or performance issues live, or is it after the meeting? So this will be after the meeting. So it's the near real-time feed that Evan had described. So after the call ends, some data is gathered, stored in the tenant. We pull that in. It's typically, I mean, I think Microsoft, I don't want to put words in Evan's mouth here. I think they guarantee or, or claim it's about 30 minutes. In our experience, it's far faster than that. It's typically 5, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, so it's it's fairly timely, uh, but it will be after the call uh, has ended. Excellent. So let's let's talk about augmenting. Going to our next slide and talk about augmenting the call quality dashboard. So um, on the last slide, you know, we, we really discussed the idea of starting with the call quality dashboard, looking at the call analytics, looking at the data that's in there. You covered it great, just how how you were able to expose that within Vantage DX. But um, I want to go back to something you talked about earlier, Rob. And I'm going to stick with you for a moment, and then Evan, I've got a couple questions for you as well. Um, but Rob, you, you started talking about additional types of monitoring. We touched on real user monitoring, which Teams did. Maybe you could break down that a little bit more, as well as you talked about synthetic monitoring. I'd love to, could you talk about a little bit more about those and then what kind of data outside of the CQD is collected? Absolutely. And uh, we, we like to wrap a narrative around this or a story around this to sort of walk a customer through this process. Um, and, and it largely starts, so we, we, so we have, we call this the pro narrative, prioritize, resolve, optimize. And the prioritize really starts with kind of the data that we were just talking about with call quality, where it's, you know, what is happening in the organization? Who's having a bad, bad experience? Which locations are having bad experiences? All driven from that call quality data with a number of different ways to slice and dice it. And that's really intended to, to help uh, an organization prioritize, well, where should I spend my time? Uh, debugging or troubleshooting teams issues. Once I know where to spend my time, I can move into the resolve part of this narrative and say, okay, now I know Geneva are having issues, Nick is having issues. Now we can deploy uh, some lightweight diagnostic probes, which run as a, as a little window service. And we can start mapping out now, what are what does that end-to-end -end picture look like? There's a little uh, sneak peek on the image on this slide here, but I'll, I'll show it in a little more depth soon is that end-to-end -end view, right? The hops from your local network, through a proxy, through across your internet, and into the Microsoft data center to understand uh, where is that bottleneck, right? Is it something to do with Nick? Is it something to do with Nick's internet access? Or is there actually something going on with Microsoft? Uh, and once we get our arms around that, we can start to fix these issues by using this data that we're, that we're extracting from this, from this monitoring. 
Uh, and then we can move to the optimized part of the story where we have this, we talked a little bit about synthetic transactions earlier. Uh, part of Vantage DX has what we call robots and robots interact with all facets of Microsoft 365, including Teams. And we actually uh, execute user actions. So the, the robot is behaving as if it's a user. It's having Teams calls, it's sending email, it's uploading and downloading content to OneDrive and SharePoint, it's checking free busy times, it's all the types of things that a user might do. Uh, and the idea is the robot catches the next set of problems, not your users, gives IT a heads up, and then you can do the diagnostics that we just talked about, but instead of it being in response to somebody yelling at me, I'm doing it in the response of a robot giving me a heads up. So it's interesting, um, Evan, I'm looking at the screenshot that's there and I see that path analysis and it sort of makes me think that right off the bat, having this as an additional layer over just what Microsoft has would be kind of key to helping organizations understand if they are or, or not sort of under the umbrella of where Microsoft would think how, how, how they say, how they say the best practices for architecting a connection between uh, the user and teams. I mean, would you agree that? And also do you find that organizations that's part of their issues is the way they have users connect to teams and it's just not direct, even though maybe the organization thinks it is? Happens all the time. And, and Nick, I couldn't agree more. And the way that we need to break this down is there's the internal network, like I'm at home right now, so my internal network here, that's one segment. And I think Rob mentioned earlier, sure, you've got family members, maybe my wife is streaming some high definition content, the kids are playing games on the internet, that all consumes my network bandwidth internally here. So having visibility into that is important. Then there's that segment from my home to my telco, that's another segment. And then there's a segment from the telco into the Microsoft network. Having that visibility to understand that media path, whether it's a call, whether it's video, whether it's content sharing is critical. Because I think we mentioned earlier, as we move through the network and we hit different routers, different proxies, every one of those components and every one of those hops has the ability to inject latency, packet loss and jitter, the three things that doesn't matter what platform you use will impact the media performance, which means I may have a poor experience, which means you may have a poor experience or vice versa. We want to eliminate that by understanding, again, those three network segments, as well as how close each individual is to hitting the Microsoft network itself. Now that, that makes perfect sense here. So Rob, I'm going to go back to you for a second here. Um, you've talked about some of the kinds of monitoring, but can we go back to, you know, the last, the last slide I asked you sort of, uh, how are you utilizing the CQD data in augmenting the visibility to it? And you showed us some of that. Um, what are some of the data points that are outside the CQD that help sort of augment the organization's ability? You talked about, you know, being able to respond and pinpoint and that sort of thing. Can you, can you go through some of those? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, we talked, I just talked about that PRO story. So some of the stuff that I just showed a few minutes ago would, would deliver that prioritize uh, part. And I'm going to use, I've got a, a, a service here for frontline workers. And for us, a service can represent a, a, a large number of different things, right? Some organizations like to look at this by region, by department, by particular application, right? They might have a role for Exchange and OneDrive and Teams and SharePoint and so on. Uh, and then the subset of users is a very popular use case that we hear where organizations want specific visibility into VIPs, board members, frontline workers, that sort of thing. So I've carved out an example for today around frontline workers. And if I drill in here, I'm going to see three primary buckets of how we look at the health of my frontline workers, uh, starting with the end users, which is the uh, call quality data that we already touched on a few moments ago. So I'll skip over that for now. Uh, and then we have uh, how well is the application performing uh, and how well is the supporting infrastructure performing. So we talked about the R part of that, the resolve of that PRO narrative. That's where this infrastructure comes in, right? What, what, are the, what is the health of all these supporting un underlying infrastructure in order for my users to have a good experience? And this touches on a few things that we've been talking about. You know, first has been, uh, I'm, I'm in our Ottawa office today. And there are, there are some network devices between me and the edge of my network here. 
that are being managed by uh, PRTG, it could be any network monitoring system. We pull in a lot of this data into our platform. Uh, well, understanding the health of those devices is really important to understand if I'm going to get a good service, right? And this is something where we get back to uh, some of the trends and analysis that Evan was touching on. If I see that, you know, across my organization, all the issues seem to be centered in the Ottawa office, but when people are in Ottawa at home, everything is fine. You know, this, this insight of, well, maybe there's some devices in the Ottawa office that are impacting the user experience. Here we would see that and we could drill into it. Uh, the other part we have here is my frontline workers are using uh, Teams phone systems. And so we have a uh, PSTN, an SBC in play, a SIP trunk in play, and we're actually pulling in data from the SBC. In this case, I have an audio codes uh, SBC that I'm, that I'm managing, and I can pull in the health and information about that SBC uh, to know if that my frontline workers are having a bad day. You know, is the SBC infrastructure performing well? And so this is a new addition, and you'll see more and more uh, data around the PSTN part of the puzzle as, as that applies to certain types of users. Uh, and then last but not least, we get this network diagnostics that I touched on, uh, and I'll just skip right into the drill down here. Uh, and this is our interface um, where we're mapping out between the frontline workers and the Microsoft Teams data center, all the hops that lie in between. Uh, now to make this a little more readable, I can group this by who owns uh, each of those hops. So now I can see, you know, there's some local network for my frontline workers. Uh, it goes through an ISP, goes into the Microsoft front door, and into the data center. And in this case, everything looks green. We have no issues. We can see the breakdown of those three metrics that Evan just mentioned that are critical for, for any real-time uh, communication. Uh, and everything looks good here across all, all the hops. The, the other thing that we're able to do in a little more graphical perspective, again, back to that VPN scenario we talked about that, uh, that we hear quite a bit, is uh, instead of someone having to look at all this data or hops and try and figure out, okay, is my traffic traversing an ocean or some large geographical distance, uh, we now show it graphically up in the top here. And so my frontline workers who are in Southern France, I can see they are you know, using a very uh, nearby uh, front door from the Microsoft network. So you know, they're probably, showing a very small number of hops to get into the Microsoft data center, which, which, is, a, which is a great uh, great model for them to get a good experience. And just to contrast that with, with another example here, I'm going to click on Bangalore, uh, and we have a, a probe deployed there. Here we see that situation happening, right? The Bangalore traffic is actually going into the uh, front door, the Microsoft front door in US East. Well, that's, that's not going to be a great recipe for a good experience for the people in Bangalore. So, uh, again, a nice, nice addition based on the data, visual representation. People understand it really, really quickly without having to, to, to dig into the detail behind it. Um, if I jump back up, so I'll, I'll, uh, I want to touch a little bit about the application piece, right? I talked about robots and synthetic transactions. So that's where we can pull this into the application part of the puzzle. Uh, and that's sort of represented by this box here. We also pull in bulletins from Microsoft. So Microsoft will post bulletins in the tenant for particular applications. And so having those side by side is interesting to say, well, Microsoft is saying there's some issues with Teams and our robots are saying, yeah, we, we tried running Teams calls and we're getting some errors as well. Or maybe it's some particular uh, aspect of Teams, right? Uh, video calls are still working, but I can't create a channel or I can't post content to a channel. So the robots are going through a very granular set of actions to be able to pinpoint what's working and what's not working. And so I've got one of our dashboards here that I'll just uh, bring up. And this is the output of, uh, of what those robots are doing. Uh, while this is just loading, I'll say that one of the big benefits is the robots are all pre-configured with Microsoft knowledge. It's a, you know, a, a point of pride from our telos that we're we're narrowly focused on the Microsoft ecosystem and and Teams in particular, and as a result, the software comes prepackaged with a lot of insights that help you get started with well, what should I monitor? What's good? What's bad? What threshold should I apply? All that type of stuff based on Microsoft best practices. Uh, again, back to you know Evan made this point earlier. You know you shouldn't have to throw you know your best level three people at this problem. Level one and level two prop people can consume this data get some insights and triage effectively and drive down that mean time to resolution. So the, the dashboard here, just to quickly talk, touch on it, we see you know, an ongoing MOS score based on the, the calls that the, the, my, the robots are taking. 
We have a breakdown. I've got robots deployed in a few locations around the world. What does the performance of each of the actions that they're running look like? Uh, again, a more visual way here. Uh, and again, just to reinforce, we're, we're talking about teams, of course, today, but these robots span the entire Microsoft 365 suite. So if you want to test mail delivery, hybrid scenarios, Active Directory authentications, SharePoint, OneDrive performance, the robots are testing every aspect of that and giving you insights 24 seven and again, the real, the real value here is let the robot tell you about the next problem instead of your users. Yeah, would you, would you go down that path a little bit? Because we, we, I started this off by talking about um, how CQD is, you know, is reactive in nature and that it's providing, even you said it's you know, five, 10 minutes, and of course, Microsoft promoting 30 minutes after the call, but we're, it's, it's reactive. Now you know something did happen. Um, in this case, since the, the robots are simulating a user, then it's providing our audience with a proactive way. I mean, obviously, if the problem is Microsoft, there's nothing they can do to fix it other than to notify their users there's a problem. You know, we already know about it. But um, can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the proactive nature of being able to you know, stem off an issue before a user is actually impacted because of the robots? For sure. Yeah, there there are some uh, a few different examples here. One one is a a pretty simple example, and admittedly, it's fairly rare. But you know we have some some issues where there has been a Microsoft issue in a particular region, uh, and the robot picks that up right away because it's just sitting there trying to do these actions all the time. And we've had you know lar especially large enterprise customers. You know think of the organizations with you know six figure employees. Uh, if if they're sitting there and they're not sure that Teams is unavailable or OneDrive is unavailable, and they start creating tickets or calling your service desk. You know, that could potentially be a flood of activity for your help desk team, whereas the robot is going to give some uh, very proactive information about what's happening. So you can reach out to your employee base and say, hey, you know, if you're in if you're in France, there's a there's an issue right now. Just hang tight and, you know, we'll, we'll get back to you when you can try again. Don't don't uh, don't flood our help desk uh, system. Right. Um, and, and there are. So that's a very simple example on the Microsoft front. We've seen examples as well where they deploy a robot into an office. Uh, and they immediately see uh, all types of problems at particular times of the day. And again, that comes back to you know that whole office architecture that Nick, we've talked about in the past, where you know, everyone comes back to an office that was designed for voice and you know starts having teams calls in their offices. And we've noticed it's a, it's a bit uh, it's a little bit sad, I guess, but you know I see like all these people come back to the office. We're in the same meeting, but we're all in our offices or cubes joining from teams. So, you know, I can see I can see the guys sitting out there and, you know, we're not using the board meetings as, as effectively as we were before. And of course, that has an impact on the the capacity of the network for the office. And so if you can correlate, the robot will see that, right? And we can see with the robot, wow, the experience from the robot perspective is really bad at these particular times of the day when we know people are in that office and we can start to correlate this data together to take some action on improving the network in that office. Now that, that's great stuff. I, I, I appreciate that because I know that our audience is always trying to figure out not just is there a problem, but would love to know before it actually happens and then have a, a means to try and uh, solve it if it's possible. Like you, you showed, I think, you know, in one of your drill downs, it was like a Cisco, uh, you know, device of some kind that was having an issue and it was red. You know, and then maybe it's just something internal that's actually the problem, yeah. or at least identifying. Nope, it's a service issue with Microsoft, and you can notify the people impacted before they bother calling the help desk. So that's always helpful too. They can find their own workarounds and, you know, the shadow IT or whatever. You know, they, they can do something else to try and at least keep themselves productive. Evan, um, th this being sort of uh, from two perspectives, one being uh, a set of technologies that's adding visibility to augment what CQD and what Call Analytics does, and then the other perspective being that it's a Microsoft partner that's doing it, that's trying to fill in some of those gaps again that Microsoft purposely leaves there for the partners to, to address. Um, how does Microsoft view this sort of augmented uh, ability to see everything end to end in order to you know, end up with achieving hopefully better service quality on, at the tail end. Yeah, Nick, great question. And I'll put it simply, if it wasn't for partners like Martello, I wouldn't have my role at Microsoft today. All I do is work with partners. That's it, to make sure that they're successful. So we embrace partners. We need our partner ecosystem and partners like Martello. And there's, I was a partner for 25 years before I came to Microsoft. I came to Microsoft because of the 
the building of the part of the organization that I'm in to help partners. So we embrace what they do. We know Microsoft doesn't do everything and it creates opportunities for partners like Martello to build upon the solutions that we have and even inject new capabilities and, and simplify some of the things. So our organization of Global Partner Solutions exists solely for the purpose of helping our partners be successful. I think that pretty much sums it up. I do I do appreciate that. Um, I do have a couple of questions. We're just maybe shift gears for a moment. Um, there's a, a couple of questions. Uh, Petri had asked, you, Rob, you were talking about the robots. You and I are having a bit of a conversation about that. And uh, Petri says, are you able to run the robots uh, beside the user's own workstation, like in the background on their same workstation, or does it need its own workstation or I'll, I'll add in server, as the case would be. When you have a, a wide environment, then in my mind, few robots are not able to give a valid view. So there's sort of two parts here. One, how's the how would you architect this? And two, sort of in a, a much broader sense, how would you architect this? <laughs> yeah. So uh, typically, our, our customers would deploy a robot near clusters of users. So you know, in an office, uh, near an office, public cloud infrastructure is close to where your users might be. <clears throat> the robot can also live on an endpoint. So we do have customers that will deploy that right to a user's endpoint. They're that, that can be a bit more difficult to manage only because you know it's, a lot of people are mobile now, right? So if I'm if I'm my robot is running in my office and then I leave and then out at home and then I'm at the Starbucks office, you could you know you have to uh, take a look at that data with that um, context in mind, right? If I'm seeing that there's bad experiences on my robot, I need to know well where was the user when that robot was running and have the context of that network piece and that sort of thing, which. Uh, frankly, the diagnostics piece that we touched on, that end-to-end -end view, would be more relevant because now I can see whether you know Evan is in the Starbucks or at home or in an office. I have the context in that uh, network path where he was, and I can pinpoint. Okay, correlate back to the CQD data, which we talked about, which highlights you know which networks and devices were being used. Uh, I can take that um, you know those poor experiences that I know were happening, let's say in the corporate office on a particular device and then marry that with the data we have about the diagnostics probe. So uh, to summarize, you know, it, ideally it would be in a cluster, uh, where the cluster, uh, close to your clusters of users, right? And, and most of our customers would put that into an office, for example. Um, I would just add putting my consultant hat back on um, that it would make sense that you think about uh, placing robots, and I'm not a Martello consultant at all. I just know how I understand how this this works. Um, if you were trying to put this and have a a wide amount of coverage and a granular amount of coverage, you might also let's take the the example Rob's talking about that you know, you put one robot in an office. But if that office happens to have a set of users that are connected via a wired network and some that are wireless, then you might actually have two robots and you'd have them delineated somehow in the application, which I don't know how to do in Martella, but I'm assuming one can, where you could say, this is the Paris office wired, this is the Paris office Wi-Fi, you know, things like that, so that you have that granularity by, to use Rob, use your term, clusters of users to further granularly define clusters of users. Instead of just saying the office, let's go deeper. Let's go uh, first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor. I mean, Rob, would you agree? Absolutely, great, great point, yeah. Yeah, so I just made that up. I, I have no idea, I'm just, <laughs> I, it's, it, it makes sense. Um, all right, so um, a couple of questions came in here. Ray, Ray, I think works for the government, because Ray says, is this software DFAR and ITAR compliant? But he asked early on, so I'm not sure if he was talking about Teams or Vantage, so maybe I could let you both answer. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, might be something we have to follow up afterwards. Yeah, those are those are government compliance standards. So, uh, so Ray, let's do this then. S someone from Artello reach out to you and get you an answer for sure, and let you know the answer to that. So that that won't be a problem. We'll do that for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, Holger's asking, do you use an agent on Windows clients to get performance data from that client? So right now we just rely on the Teams client itself gathering information at the time of the call. Uh, we don't deploy an endpoint ourselves to each of those uh, devices. Uh, the diagnostics probe is something that gets deployed to the endpoint to gather additional information, but we really only recommend doing that uh, when we've identified that endpoint to be the source of some poor Teams calls uh, to avoid having to deploy agents everywhere. 
Um, so, you know, really we see, we see the team's client as our uh, sort of endpoint collection at this point. There may be opportunities to, to bolster that from a partner opportunity in terms of expanding that with apps and things like that in the team's ecosystem. But today we're, we're relying on native functionality that Microsoft provides through the client. No, that makes sense here. Um, there's a question here that might be for you, Evan. Um, there's another Evan asking you, Evan. Um, so it's the it's the, the, the it's going to be a good question, Evans. then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Well, it's it's a government question again. Uh -oh. um, Evan's wondering, and this is sort of outside the scope of Teams, but it's it's related to Teams data. Is wondering if there's going to be a Power BI connector for GCCH later on this year. Hmm. Yeah, that's outside of my knowledge window, which is only about this big. Um, something that we can we can find out and ask um i'm okay. gonna go out on a limb and say probably but again that's not the product that i'm i represent or i'm not familiar with so yeah. i'll have to defer it to smarter people than myself all right evan we'll, we'll get the other evan not you evan the other evan in the audience will get you an answer so we, we tried there um oh ray was talking about vantage uh, whether vantage was um uh, itar and uh, the other yeah i, I mean we we do have, have some large u.s government bodies as customers. So uh, I want to say yes, but uh, I, I'd rather get a very accurate answer for Ray. So we will follow up. Yes, I'm trying to see if there's other questions. There's a couple of comments in here. Uh, oh, okay, this is actually one that we, we talked about early on. Um, this had to do back when we were discussing the idea of architecting. And, um, and I had mentioned, for example, the uh, removing of anything that was going to uh, evaluate the network traffic. And so Alfredo asks, are you mentioning to circumvent all endpoint security to improve call quality? Uh, and how do we make, meet both good call quality and endpoint enterprise security? And so, I mean, Evan, maybe you can address it from a, I, I know Microsoft's uh, message, especially when you look at their best practices for architecting is, you don't have to worry about any of the traffic going to Microsoft 365, we have the security side of that taken care of. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that where Microsoft maybe has in place just at, at, a, at a broad level? Um, and then maybe Rob, you, you can talk about it from a standpoint of, um, with end to end, you know, does that actually, have you seen that actually be one of the things that's you know, internal security services actually cause a lag? So maybe Evan first. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, don't pass anything that, that that's a layer of security, but if we break it down and we've talked about split tunneling for the VPN previously, and really when it comes to the split tunneling, what we want to do is the media traffic that we're splitting out from a team's perspective so that it's not going across your VPN and that traffic, because it's encrypted and it's created, creating a secure tunnel, putting it across a VPN or any type of proxy that would be adding a layer of security becomes unnecessary. Um, and the question then becomes, well, what is your, secu your, your security posture and, and, and is there compliance and regulatory things that you have to adhere to um, from a Microsoft perspective, again, Put the traffic that's necessary through your VPN and through your security devices, but the media traffic from a team's perspective, you split tunneling so that it gets to the Microsoft uh, cloud more quickly and, of course, comes back down to you more quickly. I'm not sure if that addresses the question, but um, that's the way that I look at it. It adds some color. Rob, what do you what do you think as far as when you've looked at customer data trying to identify a, a problem? How often does something involving security internally with you know improper routing, the, the hairpin turns to hit a service like that, you know, those kind of proxies, how often are they a problem or what kind of problem do they end up, you know, creating? Yeah, no, so we, we do see this quite a bit. Uh, and it's a combination of uh, internal, I wouldn't, I'd say it's less internal. There, there have been some use cases of some internal device that we've identified through that hop by hop network analysis that's introducing packet loss uh, into the stream. But I would say the most common example by far is what Evan was just talking about as well, where you know they have, they've had a historical policy of everything going through a VPN, and we identify that as part of the you know a trial or proof of concept that we go through. And, you know, leaning on Microsoft best practices, we say, you know, you should really be splitting that media traffic out to get a better experience. You know, keep the rest of your traffic going through the VPN. That's fine. Uh, and so we see that a lot, but we also see, um, you know, a lot of willingness uh, from the customer to do so once they understand 
the, the benefit and the Microsoft security posture is quite strong. So they, they you know, they're, they're comfortable making those changes. Yeah, a couple other questions here. And then uh, before I get into this though, I see that it looks like Stefan has actually joined. Stefan, are you on mute by any chance or are you on? Can you speak? Because if so, then I, I'll, I'll throw a couple things your way, but not sure if you are or aren't. Then I will continue on. And if you happen to jump in, feel free to pipe in. But um, so Clint's asking Rob, uh, with real-time call quality telemetry data, available, will Vantage be able to tap into that and proactively alert on meetings having a current issue? Sorry, the question I meant, the question is about the real-time? Real, real-time call quality telemetry, telemetry, excuse me, available for conferences. Yeah, so right now we, we don't have programmatic access to that data from Microsoft. Um, I, my understanding from a recent conversation with Microsoft uh, is that this is a roadmap item, and when it's available as an API, we will be certainly consuming that data and providing it to our customers. Excellent. And Stefan, you made it. Yes, I made it. I'm so sorry, all. I had an urgent family crisis. My son's That's car right. was broken down on the freeway, and I'm back, and I'm happy to see you all. <laughs> well, let, let's do this, Stefan. Um, since, since we didn't get a chance to kind of get your... Um, your input throughout the webcast. Can I put you on the spot and sort of maybe you could tell us a, I'll call it a start to finish, sort of this is of where course. you were before, you know, why yes. did you want to monitor team's quality yes. and what are you able to do today? Could you do that for us, please? I can do that. I can certainly do that. Uh, not long ago, I reached out kind of blind. I actually find found Martello on the first search. I reached out to the guys. We needed deep insight to our Teams, Office 365, network, everything going on. We were not happy by being able to say it works. We needed, we needed the telemetry and the numbers. Reaching out to these guys was very, very nice. I was taken deeply serious, caught by surprise by the support, backup, the case making, everything. Today we are using this to an extreme. I just had a meeting earlier today with the vice president from another company we bought and we need to implement this here in Spain globally as well as we already have here. So for us, the SLA, the telemetrics, the visualization for the sea level is an absolute success. The onboarding was the greatest success of all. And what can I say? I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm actually a paying customer. What, what caught us was that we could not unsee this information again. So it, it was very simple. Once our case was solved, thanks to the team, we were in this and hopefully I will deploy it globally in 30 more cities soon. So that was a very fast rundown. Sorry, again. That's okay, we had a couple minutes. It's interesting, you you mentioned something that in, in just now that we talked about together yesterday and I'm gonna augment it a little bit. If you guys remember Evan and Rob, um, Stefan said, once you see it, Meaning, once you have this visibility, you can't unsee it. Like you now, you need it. And I, I think that would, that came through just to what you're talking about, Stefan. You're like, now I need it for the Spain office. I need it for this other yes. subsidiary, and yet, because you're like, I I need to have that visibility. So um, that's good stuff. So I really appreciate you being here. Um, uh, one last question here, maybe for you, Rob, and then I'm probably going to close the socks for about two minutes to the top of the hour. But Mike is saying, how does Vantage DX capture surface hubs to be used for team meetings? Mm -hmm. uh, great, great question uh, and a timely question. We just pushed an update to uh, our cloud package on Tuesday this week, which includes the ability to to monitor that information. So it's pulling in all the team's meeting rooms as well as the devices that are used in those meeting rooms so that you can you can uh, uh, answer that question, right? If everybody's having a poor experience in one particular meeting room, is it one particular device that's in that meeting room that's causing the source of all those problems? 
No, good stuff here. So we're sort of at the the we have a minute left. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. If I, I think I answered everyone's question in the audience. If I didn't, uh, although Alfredo, I'll, I'll I'll address this real quick. You talk about it opens a large hole in security. Microsoft's general um, perspective is they're going to provide the security uh, to the Microsoft 365 data. They're helping with that already built into the the Microsoft 365 cloud, um, and the split tunneling internally. You've got your own security devices, which is what we're talking about, your security services that are running that might actually cause latency. But you had originally asked about endpoint security. No one's saying don't turn off endpoint security. Don't do that. We're just talking about if you have other services that are watching the network traffic between Microsoft, between, excuse me, the endpoint and the Microsoft cloud, those are the things that cause latency. And that's where Microsoft's general perspective is always been, we got that. We're covering that so you don't have to. Um, so that's where they'd rather you have the user go directly to the Microsoft cloud. And then the split tunneling helps you go to everything internally. And then if you want to have your own security services and proxies and whatnot, you know, and uh, anything that's going to uh, inspect, deep packet inspection, that kind of thing, go ahead and do that. So hopefully I answered everyone's questions. If I didn't, um, I know we owe Ray an answer still, but um, we'll, we'll someone reach out to you from Martella Direct to get your answer question, a question answered, excuse me. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and close things out. Um, Evan. Really appreciate you being here. Good insight from the Microsoft perspective. Thanks a lot. Stefan, glad you could make it. I mean, honestly, we were worried about you. I'm glad at least you could come here and say something. Hope your son's okay. Hope the car's fine too, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then Rob, always a pleasure. We do these all the time and uh, seem to enjoy ourselves. So uh, everyone in the audience, thanks for attending. Appreciate your questions and comments. Again, if, if uh, someone didn't get your uh, question answered or we didn't get your question answered, someone will reach out and make sure that you uh, get that question answered. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out today's webcast. Thanks a lot for attending, and we will catch you on the next one.